Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to a sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the the uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode I Mud, uh, which features the return of perhaps the greatest of Star Trek supporting characters, Harcourt Fenton Mud, Harry Mud. Uh, the only character in the entire original series who returns for two episodes. So, yeah. Um, so, basically, the Enterprise gets taken over by an android. Uh, he's like, I'm going to blow up the ship if you don't, if you attempt to interfere with me, because we're going to this particular planet. They get there, the android is then like, all right, um, you guys... Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Uhura, and Chekhov, you're all beaming down to the planet. When they get there, they find that it is a planet filled with androids, uh, 200,000, 207,000 of them, something around there, um, all ruled over by Mud the First, King Harry Mud, uh, who got into some various space trouble of various kinds, um, and then fled to this planet, and now has been ruler of the android population, but also kind of their prisoner, because they want to study humans, so they can be of service to humans, and they won't let him leave. So, Harry Mudd brings them the crew of the Enterprise, um, Basically, so they will let him go um, so they can study somebody else and serve somebody else. So uh, that that's basically what happens. Uh, the Enterprise crew is none too pleased with this state of affairs, and they ultimately end up uh, sort of realizing that the only way that they are going to get out of this is if they attack Norman, the main control android, uh, if they attack him with illogic that he will as an android not be able to process so they put on these like weird little skits and whatnot where they just like pretend stuff and say paradoxical things and the androids just start shorting out um and then finally kirk just uses the liars paradox on norman with harry mud um he says Everything that Harry Mudd says is a lie. Keep that in mind. And then Mudd says, I'm lying right now. And Norman had smoking, etc., etc. Just, you know, the standard Kirk argues a computer to death shtick. Um, 
So that's the, the plot of the episode. There's a lot of interesting social justice stuff going on here. Um, one of the big things is labor issues. Um, yeah, my cat is scratching around in the litter box. I don't know if the audio is picking that up. I was going to pause the video, but I don't care. You can hear him scratching around. Um, so, so one of the big issues is, is, uh, labor concerns. These androids, their goal is just to serve. That's their whole function. Uh, they, they want to be of use to people to make people's lives easier, etc., etc. And so we have those sort of issues of automation, uh, machines taking over human jobs. Jobs that used to be done by humans are now done quickly, more quickly, more efficiently, um, and with less risk to human life by machines. And there are benefits to that because theoretically it means we get more labor time, although in reality, under capitalism, that has not happened. Um, but that was always the dream of automation, right? Is like, if we, if, if I don't have to go to a factory every day to cut pieces of wire to be made into to pins, then I can do whatever I want with my leisure time. That's the theory of automation, of course. It doesn't in practice work that way because capitalism is terrible, but, you know, there it is. So, um, so we've got that, that sort of concern. Um, artificial intelligence, automation, machines taking over labor and productivity. And indeed, one of the things that the Enterprise crew says, one of the arguments that they make uh, one of the illogical arguments that they make is that we need suffering, we need striving, we need to work, to labor, to, to suffer, etc., etc., um, in order to be fully human. Um, and the machines don't understand this, but it actually does make a lot of sense. I mean, to just be cared for is kind of an empty life. Um, and so, so we've got that element of it. At the same time, there it's it's fascinating because one of the things with Star Trek, this this show that imagines such brilliant futuristic technology, um, that has clearly made the galaxy a better place in many ways, is also a deeply technophobic or at least technoskeptical show. Uh, because alongside this question of, well, the androids want to make our life easier. They want to, to ensure that we don't have to work and whatever it is. You've also got this turn that the androids take. Human beings are greedy. They are exploitative. They are violent. We will serve human beings, meet all of human beings' needs, Therefore, eliminating the need for greed, violence, colonization, theft, etc., etc. We, we androids will control the human population by giving them the things that they want, so they no longer need to practice these antisocial behaviors. And that's really interesting. Philosophically, ideologically, that's a really interesting idea. If we meet humanity's needs, then the the motives for doing bad things will be eliminated. I can't say that it's wrong, and, and indeed Spock says that logically this makes sense. But it raises a lot of concerns, again, especially about things like freedom, self-determination, and the striving for something greater in the world, which is a recurring theme in Star Trek episodes. Um, so we've got that element of it. We've got um, concerns. What, one of the other things that, that's interesting, and in a way related to sort of the automation of labor, um, we've got, once again, significant gender role issues here and, and gender hierarchy issues here. Um, 
The androids that Harry Mudd has created are all female. Um, they're attractive female androids. Um, he has created them because he wants to be surrounded by beautiful women who are completely compliant and will do whatever he wants. Um, and there's a lot of feminist theory surrounding both um, the sort of mechanization or, or the automation of women's labor specifically, but also the feminization of labor, particularly in the post-Fordist era, the, the, the era after you transition away from an economy in the global north, at least, predominantly built on manufacturing to an economy predominantly built on service industries. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I, If you want, I can talk about those and put questions in the comments if you want. But basically, um, women's labor has been substantially automated over the past hundred years or so with the development of household technologies, etc., etc., um, but also these sort of ideas, these concerns about women serving a function within society, and not like a not like a function in the sense of like I don't. That's not the right way to put it. I guess um, this, this idea that like women. Women function in, in traditional patriarchal Western societies like robots. Women do household work. This is labor that is unrecognized. It is simply expected. Um, it doesn't account for um, individual preferences, individual objectives, etc., etc. It is simply, this is the labor that must be done. You do it. So there is that sort of automated element to it. The other interesting component in ter well, okay, so one of the other two interesting components in terms of the gender relations here is that what the androids try and use to tempt Uhura into to wanting to stay in this uh, society is the promise of her brain being transplanted into an android body that would stay young and beautiful forever. And yes, Uhura is clearly tempted by this. And that's interesting because the things that the male crew members, with the exception of Chekhov, are tempted by are all technical, scientific, or uh, knowledge-based. McCoy kind of wants to stay in their labs and study and do experiments forever. Spock wants to follow uh, their the research that they've done and, and the scientific experiments that they've done. Scotty loves the idea that he could just build any technology he could imagine. But Uhura is tempted with youth and beauty. That's an interesting, interesting distinction. Why is the one female crew member who's transported down offered something rooted in the body rather than something rooted in the mind? Think about it. Now, the other crew member who's transported down and who, whose sort of desires we get to see is Chekhov. Uh, Chekhov is very young. Chekhov's like, 18, something like that, 19, 20, something like that. Um, he is tempted basically with wine and women. Uh, but you know, that's fine. It is what it is. Um, but then the other thing in terms of, of the gender, gender relations, gender dimension of this episode is Harry Mudd's other android. He's created an exact replica of his wife, um, who he periodically just turns on and she starts nagging him and he gets to say, shut up, and she stops. And he derives great joy from this. Um, he, sa he says that she literally drove him into space with her incessant nagging. Um, and so 
And so now he gets the gleeful experience of of telling her to shut up, and she does it. When the episode ends and the androids have been overcome and then turned back on, apparently, but just like whatevs, you can go. Not that bit isn't really explained in the episode, but it is what it is. Um, Kirk and the crew maroon Harry Mud, still on this planet. But they have created a series of at least 500 of his wife androids. Uh, who don't shut up, who just continue to nag him. And this is like the worst punishment that Harry Mudd can imagine. Um, So that element, again, this idea of like women as nags, women as uh, to, to be with your wife is the worst punishment in the world. Um, This is a very anti-feminist aspect, obviously. Um, The last thing I do want to talk about very quickly is is, um, political double talk, which occurs a lot in this episode. And it's very funny. Harry Mudd is a funny character. Um, He continually uses euphemisms for the various crimes that he has committed, and Kirk and the others call him out on this. Um, so, So, for instance... He says at one point he borrowed transportation, and Kirk and the crew very correctly read this to mean he stole the spaceship. So that's kind of, that's an interesting one, because again, that's a thing that we see in political discourse. Um, This is what George Orwell called doublespeak. Uh, When, when, the meaning of a word is used to hide what it actually refers to. Um, something like saying, if, if the military, for instance, says we have neutralized a threat, what they actually mean is they've killed people. But neutralized sounds much more pleasant. So this uh, this is a way of obscuring one's meaning by using language in particular ways that isn't quite a lie, but also isn't quite the truth. And there's a lot of ethical gray areas surrounding that use of language. 